My name is Lexi. My name is Alexis Steen, and I was originally a member of the Lodge back in the early 2000s and was secretary on the board for a couple of years, and then uh, work took over and assignments elsewhere, et cetera. And um, once I retired and started really digging into genealogy, I came across um, emails about the lodge again and Joel was sending out emails about the genealogical interest group so I decided to join and um, we're here for that. My technical background is in marine science and I worked for over 40 plus years with uh, power generation industry nuclear generation, industry, uh, federal government, elsewhere, and consulting for a long time, and uh, trade association research program management, and eventually into the oil and gas industry. Um, and I've spent many years over in Russia. So um, without further ado, I think we should talk about Norway. <laughs> So I'm going to see if we can uh, share the screen successfully. And here we go. All right. And now I'm going to... Is that working, Joel? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So last fall... Joel put out sort of a request for ideas for presentations, and I had been coming across a particular type of information that I found rather odd or unique that I didn't know existed. And so I threw that out as a possible topic, and he was like, huh, what the heck is that? And um, we talked a little bit more about epitaphia, and then he said, well, why don't you do that? And I said, okay, well. And then what else might people be thinking about that is a little out of the norm, that isn't straight birth, marriage, death, um, maybe beyond one author's take of the world coming through in a big book. And so I started gathering some thoughts and this presentation um, is the culmination of that. So, I group the types of, of the sources into types and I'll be providing examples and live links. Joel has distributed to you uh, a PDF and the links work, at least they did because I checked the PDF. Um, and my focus is going to be for each source type, what information was found or not found and if you, as members of the genealogical interest group, have similar findings to share, that would be of great interest, I think, because it will expand all of our horizons. And uh, I'll mention one other thing before we leave the cover page, and that is the dragon ale bowl is, I'll call it an heirloom from my father's side of the family. And I tried translating the Gothic script. And if I'm right, it goes something like this. Thank the host and hostess um, for the meal. Drink, and on the other side, it says drink beer until you fall off the stool. <laughs> Which I found pretty amusing. Anyway, here we go. My goal really, and how I look at the research to do this is to get a better understanding of what the people were like, not just that they were born on February 2nd and died you know, in, in September 1st, um, but to dig a little bit more. And not every geographic location even has a big book. The larger municipal areas like Bergen, the city of Trondheim also don't have big books. So you have to look elsewhere. And being coming from the sciences, I'm nosy, aka curious. 
And I want to know who, what, why, where, when, and how. And as a scientist, I've published. And so I always think of, well, who's been out there and wrestling with some of the same issues may have already found an answer or part of an answer or resolved that it's unresolvable. So I've gone through and with this perspective provided the information. And sort of as a, a lead in, if you look at these two photos, these are the same people two years apart. This is on their way leaving Norway. And this is about two years later. And I tell you, if you didn't know that it was the same couple, I wouldn't think that they were the same people. But the culture really changes appearance from being in their bunad to dressing in classic Western clothes at the end of the 1800s. So the first thing I'll show you is just the list of how I grouped the types of information I find and that I'll be presenting today. And we'll follow this through. And I've thrown the dragon here because sometimes I really find these brick walls to be such an irritant and uh, at the same time, a motivator to dig further. So fighting off the dragon, here we go. Surname specific family books. Now I knew these existed because a cousin uh, from Norway when I was over visiting gave me one. And if you look in the small window, if you see me, you can see a photo of this. It's about an inch and a half thick. And it's quite detailed. It covers centuries, individual bios. Um, the families are coded because it goes uh, the first person, their wife, and then it starts children. But if they're drilling down, you have child one and then their wife and their children. And then if you keep drilling down, you've got a sequence of numbers. So the coding helps you keep track. There's usually an index at the back, so you can look up a particular name and find them. The authors are fairly detailed. They give you birth, marriage, death data as they find it. Sometimes you get sources and you can find copies of portraits. For example, this is one of my sixth grade grandmothers, Sophie Christian's daughter with a very fancy hat, hairdo, jewelry, etc. cetera. Um, Surname specific family books can be found electronically. And actually I was looking for something else and came across the same hard copy of my Sletna Heiberg online. Someone had scanned it. I've also found Sletna Boog from Interlibrary Loan the pedigree of the Dye family in Norway by Interlibrary Loan, Sletten Dean by Electronically and Munth Electronically. So later on in the talk, there are some sources that will provide you indexes and lists for surname hunts. And even if um, it may be a sidelight to your main line that you're following, they mention brothers, cousins, people they interact with, and you might find some good other cross-references through sources. The alternative under biographies is a particular person or a very narrow time frame. So this one is an example, some information on the merchant in Bergen, Sievert Matson. It's a much smaller volume, instead of like an inch and a half, this is uh, about a third of an inch. Very detailed biographical information. Photographs of significant personal documents. Historical analysis is provided, especially of interest was uh, transcriptions of letters 
that had been written by his children describing their childhood growing up in his house, meeting people who had come to Bergen as part of his business and uh, the places they had traveled from. Portraits like the one shown here. And amazingly enough, I'm even in this book because it was published so late. Now, the author of this one, Sudi Madsen, is a well-connected family member. And my observation is that many of the authors of these types of biographies are family members. And that probably gives them an advantage because they have access and easier access to family records and archives. Has anyone found books like these and used them? The surname specific books? I okay. found one in Bergen on Fleshers and it was very useful. On the Fleshers okay. in Bergen, um, in the library there, and I found my great grandfather's photograph as well as generations back. Great. Well, I find this very interesting because I didn't know about these books, but I wrote one <laughs> on my family. Ah. <laughs> I, I started with my parents and got them to tell me what they knew about uh, their uh, families. This is the one on my father's family. And I did many of the things that you have mentioned, including whatever portraits I could find. I made a picture album at the beginning. I did this about 20 years ago. And I didn't know anyone else doing this kind of family history at the time. I just uh, did whatever I could figure out doing. So this is really interesting. Well, you're one of those well-connected family members. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next type of sources um, is what I call the mother load. Man, oh man. Um, I kept seeing this term hyphenated lamp thrap. I didn't know what it was. I thought first it was a thing. And then I thought, well, maybe it's a hyphenated person's name. And finally, after digging around, I figured out it was two authors whose, because people uh, depend on their work so much, they're just hyphenated. And this is the Bergen's diocese bishops and priests after the Reformation. It's two volumes, it's available uh, online, and I'm gonna click on this link and just show you how massive it is. But before I do, just let me tell you, it's biographies of every priest, birth, marriage, and death, where they went to school, um, what jobs they got, where they got their calling to priesthood, did they do their job well? Like one of my ancestors, he must have been a dog. He got complaints from his parishioners, brought in the dean, he got fined. Others, you know, were uh, beloved. Some get transferred repeatedly, talks about wives, their children. Um, and it's organized by deanery. And this sort of gives you a sense. I snipped one. So there's four parishes in the Mitrason deanery. And then the surname groupings are alphabetical in the index. And these are the pages where the particular surname starts. So let's just take a look. Okay. Now, this is what it is. We're gonna go in and go to volume one. And here you start seeing all this stuff, all these priests. This is just volume one. We're, um, we're still just seeing your, your slide, I think. I don't think we're getting the- Oh, the you can't see this? Hmm. Screen share, well, I'm screen sharing. Yeah. So I think not, when you when you screen share, you have to go to your other screen if that makes sense. So you have to. I, I run into this at work a lot. So you right, have to there's, you there's have to go to the other screen. screen sharing. I have to do what? There's window sharing and screen sharing. 
I so you're to... sharing a window, but not your screen. Oh, interesting. Okay. And there's an option. Where is that? Now that I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Let me try it. See if I can do that. Uh, yeah. Because you were sharing a file, and you, if you want to share your screen, you have to. There it is. There it is. Yeah. So this Success. is just volume one. And if we pick one, let's pick in here, Ed. There you go. This is the parish. Here's the first priest. They're sort of in chronological order. Gives you when he was brought to the call in 1535. And he worked there until he died. And who he married. And gives you a reference. And you can go to the next page and keep looking. And then if you're not sure where you want to go, then at the end of volume two is the alphabetical list all the way from Abel to Wrangell. So if you have uh, priests in your family that worked for the Bergen Diocese, this is the mother load, as I said. So anyway, I'm gonna go back to my screen. I think he's watching this, because this is with me. And share screen back here. Okay. So are there other compilation of Norwegian diocese, Lutheran diocese? Well, not by lamp. I found that Daniel Thrapp published a smaller volume for the Christian Sands diocese. Same approach as I just showed you, indexed. It's available electronically. Um, and I have a copy, but I didn't know where I found it. So I haven't given you the link. If someone goes digging for it and you find the link of where you got it, I'd appreciate you letting me know. It's just 17th century. And um, you can see here is an example of the areas that are covered sort of all along the south coast of Norway, parts of Stavanger all the way up towards Telemark. And then Here's some of the priests and wives, actually. I've looked for Oslo. I've looked for uh, Stavanger, Christian Sand Diocese, and Trondheim. I have not found a compilation of biographies. And I was curious to learn if any of you might have looked for and found such a compilation. Yeah, okay, well, there are lists of priests and that may give you a clue if you do have a priest to where to look for time frames because the lists I found on this link, which I won't go to at the moment, is just a, a tabular list by diocese of alphabetically surname, first name, the years they were in the priesthood. So it's not birth um, and it's not necessarily death. It's when they left the priesthood and sometimes priests retired, although sometimes they died in office. Um, there are books on the histories of the cathedral schools and most priests went to a cathedral school. 
but not all the students were priests. So depending on who you're looking for, if they were literate and in a particular area, there weren't many options to get schooling. So you might find some information about them there. Um, there are smaller geographic area regional compilations for um, priest biographies. I've come across a couple. And in fact, just earlier this week, I was looking for something and came across a manuscript on the Fearsdal Parish in Telemark. And one of my guys was in there. So um, it pays just to start looking around. Now, because, oh, go ahead. Can I ask a question about the, the education aspect? Mm -hmm. I, I have a very distant cousin by YDNA named Screever, or in my mind, writer, someone who is educated. And I was wondering, say, we'll say in the 1500s, who might get, and uh, uh, the twist is, as far as he knows, he's D Danish for forever. Um, although I'm from uh, Kvinhjarad, where you just were happened to be looking a little bit ago. Uh, so, but we do connect. The DNA proves it. So, uh, I'm looking for a possible scenario if somebody became educated and possibly got that name Screever as a result. Who, who, what kind of guy? Um, would get this name is this a clerk for Tell a priest me the name it... is... can you spell it s-c-r-i-v-e-r s-c-r-i-v-e-r yeah screever screever oh that's it a could scribe. be it could be spelled with a k but he spelled yeah. it with a c it's like that's a scribe that's a separate yeah, exactly word. yeah so so you could work gets... for um um a judge you could work for a ting. You could, you know, like a Soren Screever is a district court judge. Um, yeah, so you would, hmm. they'd have to go to university. And back then, Norway didn't have a university. So they'd be at some university in Denmark. Copenhagen, uh, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. I, I just, so it's not necessarily. Uh, a religious uh, something affiliated with a religious profession it could be legal yeah ro royal okay yep but okay thanks yep and even the bishops had secretaries so okay so since norway belonged to denmark for about 300 years um, and in digging through my Norwegian uh, ancestors, and I'm finding I had so many priests, and then I ended up tracking some of them back to Denmark. So I found two compilations. One, it's akin to Lamprath. It's almost overwhelming. Uh, the priest Sophus Viberg. And I could show you this vberg.net thing, and it's a really very similar, but far more complex because he's doing the whole country of Denmark. Um, but you can look there and within each parish and then each deanery to parish, I should say, very detailed references, little blurbs, um, and then in particular, I found one for the Lund diocese and Lund used to belong to Denmark and now it's in Sweden, but the priest bios when it for back in time would be considered part of Denmark and they were sending priests to Norway. I found this electronically at Half, Happy Trust um, and you can go through and find some folks, possibly, if you had priests in 
Denmark through here. It's a five volume set published in the mid 1800s. The third category, epitaphia. <laughs> um, I had never seen this type of thing before and I came across it. So it's a synopsis of a life in a way. It's not just like on a, a gravestone in a cemetery. It's a record that a man and his wife um, wanted to have and leave for posterity that describes something about themselves. And this example I have presented here is probably about 12 feet high. Uh, it's in their parish church. And actually my sixth grade, no, the great grandfather in the center here, his brother has an even bigger one with multiple wives and even more kids in the same church. So if you look at it, it's painted in detail. It's not mosaic, it's very colorful. There are some cartouche here and here and a, some small text. <clears throat> so if you find something like this, start looking for history of it. You can look for the church. Um, and in fact, this link goes to the Dow Church. Uh, they have a written history about the contents of the church, all the paintings they have there, the property that they've got. And then you can look sometimes in academic genealogical uh, journals where you might find write-ups or descriptions of what is in the painting in the epitaphium. So here's a close-up of the image. And it was interesting for me to look and see their appearance. So they've kind of got strawberry blonde hair. Um, these two guys look alike a lot. I've circled the couple in the middle and the little one off to the left. So from uh, one of the write-ups on the epitaphium, the description was that the adult males are all wearing official attire suitable for government positions, hmm. which makes sense because uh, the father was the bailiff for Sony. The young boy to the side, circled in a deeper green, he's my ninth great grandfather, sorry, eighth great grandfather, and he became uh, a bailiff as well. Now, the mother, Anna Mad's daughter, I don't know her surname. I was trying to find that out and it was hoped the cartouche, the previous page with initials would help me. They did not. I've got SLS for Soren Lauridson and AMD for Anna Mad's daughter. So I didn't even get a first letter to help me with the surname. The text in the center beneath was a Latin inscription blessing the church. So I didn't get any uh, genealogical info. But the photos tell us something, or the painting. Um, the adult males, so over 25, all have facial hair. They're wearing the rough collars. The women are in two groups. With the black headpiece, they're married. The unmarried girls are wearing headbands. They're all kneeling on these red pillows to show piety. So they're not priests. These are bailiffs. And then a district court judge. So here we go. Next epitaphium example, much larger. It's, I'm going to guess it's 25 feet high. 
in a larger church. This is for a 10th great uncle, but uh, not a direct descendant of him, but the epitaphium was so filled with genealogical information. It was an excellent example. So he was mayor of the city of horses. And he must have had a lot of money. He's got cartouche down here, gilt, urns, angels, all sorts of fancy stuff, statuary. And the text from this center panel tells us who he was. We get his full name, tells us his job, how long he had the job, the day he died. We know his wife's name. We learn her patronymic because the panel tells us her dad's name, Master Hans Spawning, who had been the canon of Reed. And we learn when she died. We also learn the number of children they have and their genders. So in the inset with the expanded image, um, you can see Hans Olofsson and Anna Hans' daughter. And I've got four adults to either side. I figured out who they are. This is a son. He married this lady. This is a daughter. She married this man. And the two, the son-in-law and the daughter-in-law are brother and sister. And now I've got children that are very young relative to uh, the son and daughter and the daughter and son-in-law. So I don't know who they are and if they are uh, grandchildren instead and that possibly some of um, Hans Olofsson's children are just not in this image. Now, the painting above it is interesting. We've got their named characters. We've got Adam and Eve. We've here, whoops. We've got Charity, Fidelity, and we've got two ladies on either side of Christ on the cross, very religious uh, overpainting above the portrait. Has anyone worked with or used epitaphium to acquire some genealogical information? Okay, well, it, I thought it would be rare. So keep your eye out. Um, you might find some. Now, while I was on the thinking about epitaphia and and the painted images of families, I decided to look again at some portraits uh, to get some information. And here's another one of my priests, Ivor Erickson. And he was a priest on the West Coast at Lee Conger and Vic and then Dean for Sony. And interestingly, he also studied medicine under the nephew of one of my 10th grade grandparents fathers in Denmark. He was more than just literate because he published a treatise. But I'm intrigued by this portrait because of who's not in it. And I'll tell a story about that. So first, we have our Duriger Christ on the cross. This one has sort of the um, landscape if you will, of what I think would be Jerusalem in the background. And then we have actually Ivor Erickson holding his hands in prayer next to his second wife, Marin Berthel's daughter, Mule. She's got the dominant white head cover, which indicates death. And you'll also, if you look at the image between the two wives that are shown, uh, the second wife is rather pale and doesn't show much expression. Uh, the third wife, who's my ancestor, 
has a little rouge on her cheek, a little more expression and a little smile. But he's had three wives. So where's the first wife? Well, the first wife was the widow of the previous priest and she is not in this portrait. And here's the story and maybe why. <clears throat> One of my other priest ancestors was written about uh, in Lampthrap. And um, he was coming to take a new position at a parish. And the expectation then was that when a priest died, his wife, the widow, would have a year of grace to stay at the parsonage, retain her social status and the incomes to uh, her dead husband, and then to find herself a new place to live. Often, for the dominant way of handling things was that the new priest would marry the widow, thereby resolving the widow's worry about where to go, loss of income, social status, etc. Well, this one uh, situation was the widow had been widowed four times now. She was quite elderly. My ancestor was not interested in marrying this lady and uh, did not act upon the typical assumption that he would marry the, uh, the widow. And the story goes that while it could not be proven, several pieces of property belonging to the parsonage were subsequently uh, damaged severely. <laughs> the upshot was they believed that this uh, a widow was so mad that she wasn't going to get married again to priest number five that she bent her spleen. Anyway, so now one other portrait to show you just for uh, trying to get some information about people. So the first time I found this portrait for Christine Dorothea Yen's daughter. Uh, it was very dour. She doesn't look happy. The husband doesn't look happy. They're in the dark. They couldn't figure out what some stuff was. It looked like she might be holding a purse. And I didn't know what that was. Um, and it appeared there was some writing on either side of the two people. Well, she's the daughter of a bishop. So I thought, you know, she should maybe look, I don't know if well-to-do is the right word, but certainly happier in life. Uh, her husband had been an assistant to the bishop, which is where they met. He became uh, his, a priest at a parish in Nordfjord. Uh, and to put in context, you know, what the life of a priest was like, they had to travel a lot. Well, the waterways are their highways, and he drowned returning from visiting uh, an outlying area. The image is dated well before he died. They're both holding something. In the black and white, you can't quite tell if it's a book or not. There's some kind of label. I expanded the image as far as I could, and I still can't discern what it is. I found it in color. Now I can see they're definitely both holding books that look like they're nicely bound. She's got some jewelry on. This is an underskirt with some kind of pattern. And he's got, I think, some uh, a vestment on because you can see, whoops, I'm gonna go back. There, sorry about that. The fabric changes. It looks like it's brocade coming down here. There's also some text, which is a title 
And I tried to expand that. It's in Latin. And the Gothic script when painted was beyond me, but it lists her and then is something about a king. And that's as far as I could go. If I look at the close-up, now we see he is wearing a round cap. He's trimmed his beard, it appears, to match the curve of his rough collar. She's got on a brown cap with a rosette by her ear and very thin, like linen over collar. Okay, category four, the national level Norwegian genealogical organization. So the Norse Slicks history forum. They have alphabetical lists of publications by family surname. And you can go in here and it's by A, B, C, D, E, F, G, blah, blah, blah. And if you click on a letter, then hundreds sometimes names come there. Some of the books you can find electronically, others will take you to um, Norse archive where they want you to buy it. But once you get the name of the book, you might be able to interlibrary loan it or search for it separately on the internet and find it electronically. They have a journal, the North Slex Historisk Kid Script. I think of it as their annals in a way. Several issues a year, you can go there and look at the link and it'll show you little uh, images of the front cover, kind of just like this. And you can click on those and look at the table of contents to see if they have anything that you're interested in. Sometimes it's very obvious. It'll say information on person with a name or information on uh, the business of XYZ in the years span such and such. They sell PDFs so you can get them quickly over the internet. It's like, I wanna say eight bucks for one. Um, they also, if you go on their link, they have other types of publications, um, seminar outputs dealing with particular genealogical questions on particular families or family interactions. And then they have a wiki. So I'm gonna give some samples of this um, from their first journal in 1910 by Finn Grun, one of the well-known uh, authors, family history. Now the title meant nothing to me. I had no Ansbach, no Engel Jensen and no Klaumann family. However, when I've been searching, this manuscript came up because of the content. The Bringsvers from Nedenus, which was an early label for parts of Ostauger County. So I went into this manuscript and found some very good clues and discussions about um, the Bringsver family, the property they owned, and how the links were built between Hardanger and Sedestal through the years. And it was fascinating to me to learn about the interactions between the two locations that dealt with even the movement of crop, harvested crops into the Sedestal Valley, which is not a good farming area. Um, second example, I came across this by reading a blog and uh, Mr. Ned Gerbera had written a very long reply and added a link to his publication on the blog. And I actually ended up contacting him because I couldn't get the link to work. Well, he uh, had taken upon himself to put the live link directly to his manuscript without his boss's permission. <laughs> anyway, this is new answers to questions on who the Etni priest Hans Nielsen Boob was married to. 
Well, he went through very detailed analysis to make his point that there were two separate wives and a lot of people had identified the second wife incorrectly. And as a consequence of his work, I now feel very confident that my parents are ninth half cousins and they descend from the oldest son of wife number one and the oldest son of wife number two. See, so it was, the problem was solved 40 years ago. Now there's more national level Norwegian sources. The Norse Biographisk Lexicon. I don't know if you've used this, but the first version of it, which is called NBL1, was published in the early 1920s, started being published in the early 1920s. Over 5,000 articles, which are predominantly people with bios. I had a very difficult time finding them all. And in fact, I haven't yet. Um, there's two links there on which you'll find some. Um, the second link, you have to go there and then search for the term in the quotes, Norse Biographics Lexicon, and then scroll to the desired volume you wanna look at. They're alphabetical, so that helps. If you know, like the gentleman asked about Scriver, so you go to the S's and see where that played out and you could see if there was someone there. The second version of this, NBL2 was published and it does exist electronically. They've uploaded the content elsewhere and you can find the biographies pretty easily. Also, I don't know, well, before we go to select one, has anyone used the NBL before to get information? Okay, well, I suggest perhaps you try. Um, it could be quite beneficial, especially if someone's already written about them, because they often provide uh, references, even if just one or two, and you can maybe go to them and get a closer direct source. Um, select one was really interesting. It's the second link I'm giving you, which is a link to surnames to look for books that have already been published. It gives other things that you can use to go digging as well, but predominantly um, it's the surname list. Now I wanna look at Danish sources at the national level. They have their uh, society and they had a periodical which began in 1880. All the way up to 1965, the PDFs are online. You can go, you can look at their table of contents and download them. It's really easy peasy. They've got a names register for people who are in the manuscripts. And that's really good. So if you want to search for a particular person, you can go there and then first, and then uh, hopefully it's pre-1965 and then get it for free. The Norwegians were included in the society all the way up to 1926. So about 40 years of it would contain information on Norwegian people, regions, issues, history, et cetera. Now the Dansk Biographics Lexicon has three modes, similar to the Norwegian one. Originally it was 19 volumes hard copy. That has now been indexed and scanned. It's available online with optical character recognition so you can grab it and translate it easily at Runeberg. The modern mode is sort of uh, like Store Norts lexicon. Issues, you know, broad events, 
uh, not so much genealogical. The third mode, this is my label, they have the women's biographical lexicon um, with over 1900 entries. And that's the link there. Um, and actually I'm gonna show you an example of two things. So here's a, a surname book, the family name Paladin in Denmark and Norway. Here's the first one. This was from 1998, issue one, short bios by generation. And it clarified who from the Paladins came over to Norway from Denmark. I wanted to know exactly what that link was. And, um, the author, a connected family man, sort of laid out how the branches split off between Flemish, Danish, and Norwegian lines. It was very helpful, lots of references. And then here's an example from the Danish Women's Biographical Lexicon. Remember Anna Hans' daughter, Spahn, who was in that really big epitaphium. Well, I decided I would look her up. She's in there. So what do they tell us there? Well, she died in 1637. She made some legal bequests in Reeb, but she died in Horsens. Well, that's where she was living. Who were her parents? The royal historiographer and archdeacon, this was his birth and death years. And her mom was Maureen Sorn's daughter, Stodge. I think that's how you pronounce it. And uh, her birth and death years tells us when she was married to whom, a merchant and mayor. And has the dates when he died and that he was the son of a mayor, Olaf Peterson Stubby and his mom and then list their kids. And then in addition, there were three paragraphs of text about her life. Has anyone tried uh, the Danish biographical lexicon for women? Okay, well, hopefully you will, and maybe you'll find somebody in your family there. The fifth, type of uh, genealogical source information is what I'm calling county level historical and genealogical journals. So as a, just a sample from the counties across Norway, I've got Rogaland, Vestager, and Telemark. Rogaland has a yearbook with professional manuscripts since 1948. They're available electronically, and that link will take you there. And you can look at them, they're chronologically displayed. You can click on the each cover image, it'll open up and you can go to the table of contents. And this is one, it's a snip um, from 2003. And I wanted this article, the connection between priests in Rogaland and Sidestal. The next thing that Rogelin had, I discovered, well, the Carmoy Genealogical Club has translated birth, marriage, and death excerpts from several of their big de booker. And it's out there and you can find things. If you go to that link uh, in, where it says English, it'll tell you what it's about. Go to the left where they have the menus on the side and it. you can start looking there. Um, under Vest Agder, they had a different type of effort. They had a compilation of biographical information about people in Medinus, Mandels, and Lista for the time period given. And there's over 4,000 people in there um, in alphabetical order by surname. And that link will take you there. Some of the entries are multiple pages. Uh, some are much shorter. 
The, there are women with their own entries. So it's not just the men. Um, there's two yearbooks for Telemark. One is uh, their uh, local history one, and then another is for one of their um, traditional districts. Same thing, it's like a subset. And then don't forget when you're at the county level and you think, oh, I'm from a little area and there won't be anything. Don't think that because uh, the island of Smola even has its own historical society. <laughs> and they're very proud of themselves. Anyway, here's some examples um, from the yearbook for Rogaland in 2014, a very detailed analysis of family interactions between these three families based on a lot of data. I got new information and maybe even knights and minor nobility. The second example is from the Smurla's, uh, Smurla Mean. It's two small families in, and the people there from West Smurla. So they had photographs. So I have photographs of two uh, second great grandparents. Some new patronymics that I didn't have, identified siblings, and some birth, marriage, death data. Now to traditional districts. If you're not familiar with those, and I wasn't really, uh, my mom said, oh yeah, we're from Cedastal. I'm like, oh, okay, what's that? I don't know. And finally digging around, I figured out it's not a commune, it's not a parish, it's not a county. It's a totally different thing. It's a subset of a county. There are 48 of them. And often they are the manner in which authors think about their subject and they are used as labels for people like um, the Rafilka men, the Sidestal Yenta. So don't forget about your traditional districts if your ancestors are in one. So for example, Rafilk is in the northeast part of Rogaland. There was a compilation of priest biographies. It's not a diocese but just of a parish in Rafilk, and that's available electronically. Grenland is a traditional district in Southeast Telemark. They have a, uh, a, a journal, huge number of them, 1979 to 2016 are online. You can just get them for free. Sunhord land, is very large, central and southwestern Hordaland County. They have published for over a century, but only up through 1940 is available electronically. You can go there to the link and look at their file archive. They're not expensive to buy. Um, and you can uh, look at their table of contents to see if something is of interest to you. So here's an example, totally unexpected, Karen von Ansbach's Morsana. So who is that lady and what does her maternal ancestry have to do with me? I, it didn't ring any bells, but my search term indicated that the content of that manuscript was related and indeed it did. Uh, the author was really detailed and focused trying to correct and refine the understanding of certain family trees and why certain things uh, should be corrected, et cetera. And he augmented info for me on two parishes, also looked at the impact of events driving the history and actions of ancestors that he was discussing in Southern Norway and lots of references. So, okay, so now we're coming down to the last category. What I call resources closer to home. They're most always in English. 
So you don't have to learn Danish or spend time translating Danish and Norwegian. First category is autobiographies, biographies, etc. And I put two examples there. And before I knew what Cedestal really was, and I was just looking around on the internet, I came across this book. And actually, he's the author is a fourth cousin of mine. And this book is an autobiography of his childhood growing up in a traditional district in Agder, which was a poor farming area. He was orphaned and he later came to the US and became a physician. He talks about the individuals um, from his perspective, how he knew them. It was very interesting. The second one um, I came across because my, my great great aunt is in here and her uh, father, so my dad's grandfather, they were in the shipping business and she married a shipping broker who was living in New York and moved to New York. So it talks about all the businesses going on in New York and how the various people met and the events and the marriages and et cetera. The next category of closer to home as an example is North Dakota State Archives. Um, I don't know how many of you have ancestors who came and moved to North Dakota. If you do, you should probably go there and do some digging. When I started writing up um, what I've been learning about this one particular set of ancestors, the two great grandparents from Cedestal, I wanted to put in context who they were when they got here. And so I started trying to find them information about that area and came across the pioneer biography files, old settler questionnaires. And I wondered, and I'll present some information about that, but I also wondered, well, what about other states? Do they have something like that that people might be interested in? And indeed, I found that central Iowa has something that may be similar, although it didn't seem quite as uh, well developed. And then also close to home, we have two Norwegian American organizations, the uh, Genealogical Center and NASIF Library. And I believe one of the people on the call is from that organization. And then the Genealogical Association, NAGA, which is a branch of the Minnesota State um, Genealogical Society. So NAGC, which I wanna mention in particular, is planning a trip to Salt Lake City. It's a research trip for people who want to do some genealogical digging. It's going to be in mid-October this year. It's not going to be expensive. I think they're charging, is it $1,500 or something? I'm not sure if that covers the entirety of all the event. No, $1,700 for non-members, $1,500 if you are a member. And they're taking reservations now. So... If you feel the need to go with a group and uh, check out the Mecca for genealogical libraries, go to that website and sign up. Okay, so I wanna talk about what I learned from the old settler questionnaire. Well, first, I didn't even know about this. And I paid, I think $30 to get about 30 pages of the results of a questionnaire, details about his farming, his tools, the events in his life, what he built, what he learned, what their social life was like, um, and then script about stories taken down by the interviewer and then transcribed. So I've just taken some snips here and underlined particular phrases. So on the far left, I learned he had relatives in Chicago and that he had come in 1881, but he didn't officially immigrate until 
1887. So I'm like, what? I don't think my mom knew this. And so I went digging. I said, okay, he had relatives in Chicago. Who came before he did? Well, I figured it out. It was his older sister who came just the same year, but enough months before that she was able to write back, have the letter be received, and he knew where to go. I also learned when he departed for immigration, which I didn't know exactly that either before. And while he started out on the tin bowl, he didn't end up, he changed um, vessels partway. And I also learned he settled initially in Minnesota, due west of Minneapolis, before he ended up in North Dakota. And while I knew they were all fishermen, well, I didn't know that they were all fishermen, but I presumed he had been because he came from the island off the shore of Western Norway. It says he built a shack 16 feet by 16 feet and he lived there for about three years. So if you can imagine living in a large bedroom for three years in cold, cold, cold winters in North Dakota. And then the last thing in the bottom right was he, this is verbatim his storytelling. He says the first two years were terribly severe and they were afraid of the Indians, especially when they dressed up uh, and were painted for war dances. And that how that they were uh, so short on food, the Indians and my uh, great grandparents, um, it was quite distressing actually to read how hard it was initially for them. Okay, so other, what other immigrant organizations are there in the US and can they help you with your searches? Um, I have not used any of these organizations, but I was thinking about those of you who might want to tap into these and have put these out there as a cue to maybe look here or to look in your geographic area of interest. There are immigrant organizations, for example, for the Telemark County itself, for a traditional district in Upland, Goldbrand Dulles. Then there are Facebook pages. There are a variety of them. I just put this one. Many of them that I found don't give you much information. They're private, you have to join, and then you can see what's in their website. Um, there is also this Norwegian-American big dialogue, Nis Felsrud, which is a council of big dialogues, but they have genealogical resources. And one thing intrigued me, when you click on this link to the index, you can look at the top where it's a genealogical um, a tab, and you can go there and someone made a list of organizations that have big books. And I had not thought of this before, but the Library of Congress holds some big books. So if you know which ones you want, you could check out the, the list to see if indeed the Library of Congress has your big book. And this, is one of my recent serendipitous discoveries just by following up on a remark in a big book. And I'll tell you, persistence pays because the big book said that this particular great grandfather was a wood carver and he had things in the folk museum in Oslo. So I wrote them and I got a very bland reply. Oh, we couldn't find anything. So I was like, okay, well, maybe there's an error in the big book. I, I don't know. And then later I was trying to just recently confirm a possible source in Vestagder and I couldn't figure it out from their folk museum. So I wrote their archivist. Is this real? The archivist wrote back in a flash. And so I thought, man, they're on the ball. Maybe I'll ask if she thinks it's at their museum rather than at Oslo. And came back again in a flash. She said, no, I found it easily in Oslo. And she gave me the link and here it is. So a 300 year old bowl 
And as far as providing color and humor and to learn about your ancestors, this is interesting. He who drinks well, he sleeps well. He who sleeps well, he does not sin. And then he signed his name and gave a date. And on the inside rim, drink strong beer. You will be fresh and current. <laughs> and then you get the label from the museum, which is a little bit more dry, the art of the knife on wooden horn and cedar stall. So uh, this is in conclusion. I really wish you success in your quest to overcome your genealogical dragons. And that wizard down there could be you. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I will turn off sharing. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Alexis. That was uh, that was interesting, and <clears throat> I, uh, I saw a number of things that uh, that I'd like to follow up on. So I. Oh, good. Informative. Are there uh, questions, comments, other? Uh, uh, Just as a comment, uh, Alexis, your your skills as a scientist and researcher must have really worked well for you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just so impressed by all that you've found and put together and that you've shared. This is extremely helpful. Thank you oh, so good. much. You're welcome. Thank you. I, uh, I thought that was wonderful. I appreciate having the, uh, the uh, resource that we can save as well, the handout. But um, one thing you didn't mention that I had used is uh, emigration records from Norway and ship records because I wanted to find out how they came to America and I, I was able to find them. Oh, good. Anybody else have examples? Well, there was a, and as I said, this, uh, I did this research about 20 years ago, but I just looked, uh, looked up the Solem, Swigum and Ostheim ship index and they still have it online. So if anyone is interested in that. I also contacted some genealogists in Norway that were helpful with specific questions. I came across one by accident when I was looking up the area that my mother's father came from far north of the uh, Arctic Circle in Vesterålen. And um, there was a photographer that had many beautiful photographs and then he had links to other resources. One of them was a genealogist. So I contacted her by email. And when I told her the name of my um, grandfather, she immediately knew who he had married in America. She <laughs> wrote back, they had all this information. And then she got information from the Big Book there about my great, great grandfather. Um, that was uh, interesting to me that he was in charge of the, the poor fund for people who, who needed help. Mm. One thing I found that might be helpful is I have a lot of pastors as well. As a matter of fact, um, two of our, your direct ancestors are my direct ancestors. So we are obviously distant cousins. Oli Worm and Jen Peterson Schwelderkamp are both my direct ancestors. Really? So that was fun. Yes, well, so that was fun. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. But the <laughs> thing that I found um, in a couple instances was if you, go to Norway and go to the churches where your folks were pastors, even going back a while, they have the old, in a couple situations, they have the old written records. And my great-great-grandfather wrote daily records. And you can tell the story of his daily life. It's like a diary in the church. And I don't know if that was common, but... Um, it's an amazing resource to, to find that. Yes. No other priest would keep those, those journals of, of their daily life. Susan, we're getting a message that your bandwidth is low and we are having trouble hearing you. It, I'm out, I'm out by the ocean in North Carolina, so that's not surprising. Um, I was just saying, I wondered if other priests, other pastors kept 
these these daily journals that other people could resource of their relatives yeah i don't know don't know okay so uh dana i hope yeah. you appreciate it was it was fun to meet you as a cousin yeah i hope uh, i hope you appreciated the free plug dana do you want to expand on the uh, salt lake city uh, uh trip Yes, we are going to be going in October to Salt Lake City. Um, right now, it's going to be Jerry Paulson and uh, Chris Clower who are going from NAGC. And you don't have to be Norwegian to go. It can be, you know, anybody with anybody with ancestors can go because that library does have such a good collection of resources available to everybody. So. Mm -hmm. We certainly would love to see anyone who's interested in joining us. In one of our previous meetings, uh, Rhoda, you showed us the, uh, the book that you'd written uh, about uh, your family. Um, uh, NAGC has one of the largest collections of uh, family stories around, so uh, they might be interested in, in your book. Okay, tell me again who that is. It's the Norwegian American Genealogical Center and NASETH Library. There's a link in, in the handout from today. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, I, I intend to contact some of these uh, libraries and I just have a few copies left of my book and someone suggested uh, doing an electronic version and I, I probably should do that, but it's gonna take quite a bit of redoing to make it acceptable. The other thing is that my, my book includes myself and my brothers and sisters and uh, mentions their children and uh, the Library of Congress, for example, does not want books that mention people who are still living in their family history. So I have to find out whether other libraries feel the same way. Well, since I'm in so, uh, a couple of the family histories in, at, at NAGC, I, I don't think they're worried about it. Okay, good. That's good <laughs> to know. Thank you. That, that's correct, isn't it, Dana? <laughs> it is. Yes. No, we don't have any restrictions about uh, books that contain living people. Okay, good. Do you want printed versions or do you want uh, electronic? Um, uh, either is great. We do have an you know, it's a it's a regular old library, so we certainly do have shelves with with books on the shelves. We'd be happy with either. Okay, thank you. I have a question. <laughs> so, um, Alexis, you mentioned interlibrary loan. Mm -hmm. um, were you talking about between the United States and Norway? Or no. no. Okay. No, I got books from uh, Chicago, yeah. Wisconsin, I want to say Madison, and Boston. Just organized through my local library. I'm in Arlington. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So if you go to, uh, what is it, World Catalog, and um, with your title, and then you can search which is what the librarians will do um, for what local library in the US has it. And then you can see if it's available. Sometimes the librarians have extra sleuthing capabilities that you and I don't. And they found stuff that I didn't know they could find. And they also will look for less expensive options. Like New York wants to charge huge quantities, but you could get the same book from Tennessee, for example, at, you know, a quarter. So they will charge you something for the shipping and uh, borrowing, it's like $25 or something. Mm -hmm. Something. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me just uh, say that uh, we have, our, our next meeting uh, will be um, in May. Uh, we have Beth Sparrow, who's the president of the uh, Nebraska State Genealogical Society, who's going to talk about uh, DNA. 
Um, and then uh, uh, we're, we're, we'll take uh, June off largely because uh, I'm, I'm intending to be in, in Canada fishing at the same time as this meeting. Uh, and then uh, uh, we'll see where we go uh, after that. Well, this was a wonderful meeting. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. That was fun. Thank you. Yeah. Any last minute uh, questions or comments? Uh, I, I, I didn't, oh, excuse me. Uh, I, I didn't know whether everyone was aware that you can go to the Library of Congress and do research right there in their family history um, room. Okay. They, uh, they, yeah, I think they had been closed for the pandemic. But are well, they, they may be. Yeah, I don't know if they're open again or not, but that is uh, where I did a lot of research, and in, including the, um, you know, the Mormon uh, files I got on the computer there. I guess you can get that now on your home computer as well. But yeah, no, that uh, would be interesting to have have somebody uh, come and tell us about some of the resources there. I, I'm not quite sure who to, who, I, I'll, I'll make some cold calls. We'll figure out how to get somebody. Be fun. Okay. Um, Good to see everybody. Uh, um, hopefully uh, in the next couple of months, we'll be able to do this as a hybrid meeting, which will be interesting to, to try. Um, well, so I really so. appreciate being able to join by Zoom because I wouldn't be able to make it if I had to drive down to Virginia. Yeah, well understood. So Joel, have all of you done the cultural skills medal for Sons of Norway, the genealogy one, or? <laughs> uh, some have. I, in fact, uh -huh. uh, we had our uh, new new uh, member brunch this morning, and right. we're catching up on handing out just some of those pins. So I got the level two pin this morning. Uh huh. Yeah. We don't have anything at our lodge in Lancaster, and I, I. I've been so busy with this district secretary job, but I would like to start a small group and we'd be starting right at the beginning, I think. So well, you know, any way that we can we can help, I'm sure we'd we'd be happy to do that. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alexis. Oh, you're welcome. All right. And thank you, Joel. This has been oh. great. <laughs> thank all of you. Bye. <laughs> Have a good weekend. Thank you. So Joel, are we are we finished? Yeah. Uh, I think so. Let's... Okay. Well, thanks for everybody's attention. Have a good weekend. Yep. You too. Thank you. I'm gonna hit the button here. <laughs>